This is our fifth time. I wouldn't have dreamt of what I learned here. This encourages you and inspires you. And it's so relaxing and the food is great. <laughs> I love retreats at sea. And I will do it again. And you should be here. Holy Trinity is at work full time here. Welcome to the download where we discuss the news through an authentic Catholic lens. Today is January 13th, 2024. I'm Bradley Eli here with my two co-hosts, Rodney Pelletier and David Newsman. Pope Francis recently came out guns blazing against surrogacy. In a speech Monday to international diplomats, the pontiff slammed the practice of surrogate motherhood, calling it despicable and saying it commercializes women and babies. Take a riguardo ritengo indispecabile la pratica della cosiddetta maternità surrogata che lede gravemente la dignità della donna e del figlio. Essa è fondata sullo sfruttamento di una situazione di necessità materiale della madre. Excellent. Uh, kudos, hats off to the uh, Pope. He's been on that trail for a little while now. He's uh, not too fond of the practice there. You know, you're talking about renting a uterus, mm -hmm. and I can totally understand the problem there uh, with that. What's uh, David, why don't you address a little bit about surrogacy itself? Uh, you know, the, it's, it's against Catholic morals on many different, different fronts. Yeah, there are quite a few steps of the process where it, it goes against Catholic morals. Uh, for example, a lot of times it's done through in vitro fertilization, and even if it's not in vitro fertilization, it might be artificial insemination, both of which are wrong. And then you consider to get that sperm to do the IVF or to do the artificial insemination, that is usually obtained through through masturbation. Mm -hmm. So you know that's another layer of, of sin involved there. And then there's the fact that a lot of times with in vitro fertilization, um, the way it's typically done is a few embryos are fertilized and then they just kill the ones they don't want. Yeah, I mean, you have a completely manufacturing process going on here, uh, completely separating life and love at all levels. You, you, you're the what they call the, the you know the conjugal act with the with the woman, the, the mother and the father here, and a lot of times it's not even is, isn't the mother and the father of the mm -hmm. gametes involved. It wouldn't be, mm -hmm. uh, so it's completely foreign in that sense. But then you're taking whatever gametes you get from them and going over and doing something else with them. And that was one of the reasons why contraception is you're separating life and love. There is a right. fruitful act uh, of, of marital relations that are supposed to bring forth the fruit in God's design. And you're completely separating all of that. Let's take a look at uh, the catechism too, weighs in on this um, 2376 says, quote, techniques that entail the disassociation of husband and wife, exactly what we're talking about, by the intrusion of a person, probably a medical lab tech, other than the couple. And then we have donation of sperm or ovum, surrogate uterus, all are gravely immoral. These techniques, uh, uh, this artificial insemination and fertilization infringe uh, the child's right to be born of a father and a mother known to him and bound to each other by marriage. They betray the spouse's right to become a father and a mother only through each other. So there's so many things to unpack there. And the child's right to be born of a father and a mother that's known to him is completely, uh, uh, you know, foreign in here. And we're not talking about, you know, in, in one sense, adoption. Uh, is separation there, but for whatever reason, plan A is not working where the mother and father can't take care of the child and for the betterment of the child, you're seeking uh, the next best thing, which would be another set of parents who will love the child and rear the child up and bring him, you know, to the kingdom of heaven. So we're, uh, you know, to compare those things is, is a little bit different. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the, the whole thing here is just uh, completely farce. And, and Pope Francis said a child deserves a mother and a father. Yeah, and we're kind of used to Pope Francis being kind of nebulous on things. Uh, but this, uh, you know, as you noted earlier, he's been very consistent 
consistent on this throughout his papacy, and it's uh, it's refreshing to hear that, because you know what you said earlier about the, how it makes a commodity of the person. It cheapens bringing human life into this world. Now that's a double entendre there, because it's it's expensive to do that, but it it. Uh, People, if you go to the website Them Before Us, uh, people who have been conceived through that have um, written in and commented saying that, you know, they felt once they discovered that they were, you know, from a surrogate and or they were, you know, petri dish babies or whatever, that um, they feel cheap, that they were purchased, that they were not born out of love, but out of, you know, one parent wanting something you know that nature wouldn't allow or something they they feel cheapened and I think that's a very valid thought on these on their behalf you know it almost harkens back to some movie like the matrix where everybody's just hooked up to a machine we're yeah. starting to manufacture uh, people like their cattle or something mm -hmm. and then they start to mess around with the the, the, the chromosomes and all that and yeah. start you know I want mm -hmm. blonde hair I want this and that and it's just complete you everybody's trying to play God here yeah uh, and and then on the other end of the spectrum too they're like well we brought this in we can end it you know with abortion mm -hmm. euthanasia mm -hmm. and all that type of stuff it's, as well once you start playing God there's no end to it and then recently there was a case too of uh, of parents suing because they didn't get the right was it the, they didn't get the right uh, nationality of child that they wanted? Yeah, they or weren't something. given the right child. There they weren't was, given the right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, they were. It was a uh, Asian American couple, and they had two. There were two babies in the woman's womb, and they were the wrong sex, and they were the wrong ethnicity. It, they weren't. I think they were expecting it to be like their own biological yeah. children, and it was like two Caucasian males uh, who were the, supposed yeah. to be two uh, wow. Asian females so they missed out on so many levels how, how horrific though to look at your children afterwards and say well you're wrong I didn't pick you that's monstrous I yeah. can't I can't countenance that yeah, yeah. now yeah. while we're talking about the papacy there was some other uh, related news regarding mm -hmm. the, the Pope so oh yeah yeah so today uh, in the old calendar well sort of in the old calendar it's the feast of the chair of St. Peter in Rome uh, there were two chairs of St. Well, Peter. it's a few days from now. A few days, a few from, days now. from now. Sorry. 18th, yeah, yeah. Sorry. 18th, I believe. Yeah. 18th. There we go. Yeah. Uh, there was two, uh, the chair of St. Peter at Antioch and then chair of St. Peter at Rome. Uh, and that was, yeah, that feast was around for a while, but it was actually, uh, it wouldn't be on most of your, even uh, your Tridentine Mass lists uh, because John, uh, Pope John the 23rd took it. Took it out. Uh, the feast in of, of the chair at Antioch. Of the chair in Rome. In Rome. Yeah. It was I'm not removed sure. in 1960. Yeah. But you could still do a votive mass there we on go. that day. Is vote, Antioch yeah. still on the calendar? Uh, I'd have to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not 100 sure on that one. Now this yeah. is to be confused with the chair of Saint Peter, which is the feast day on the. Well, the yeah, the whole point of removing the one that will be in a few days on the 18th mm -hmm. was to avoid redundancies in the calendar. Mm -hmm. That was sort of there were a couple others that were removed. So I think the chair of Saint Peter is that in February, if I recall. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. something like that. So okay. you know, some some good liturgical uh, uh, tweaking, I guess. But I don't know. You have to wonder. You know it. That was a feast for a long time, uh, for a reason. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we have the, the 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 long you know the the lineage of the patrine office is just amazing. And even today, we're still getting uh, guidance from the Holy Father on you know such things as the surrogacy there. And like you say, there's a lot of times where you wish there would be more clarity, and it's just not forthcoming. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, you do get clarity. Yeah. On something which good. Is, which is refreshing. refreshing. Yeah. 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 And in local news, Catholic. Catholics in Metro Detroit are doing everything they can to offer support after six children lost their mom and dad in a car wreck. Ryan and Jennifer Ambrosio, local to Metro Detroit, were killed a week ago by a wrong way driver on the interstate who was fleeing police in a stolen vehicle. They leave behind six children, all under the age of 10. Loved ones have created a GoFundMe titled Support the Ambrosio Kids. As of this recording, it's garnered about $500,000, half a million dollars. A fundraising page for the family on a separate website, mealtrain.com, has raised about 30 grand. 
Um, this is horrific. Uh, I remember yeah. hearing about this when it happened and just, uh, I can't imagine. It's good, like, you know, help, help the kids out, uh, donate money. Uh, but I know at the end of the day, the kids would much rather have their parents back. Yeah. But yeah. too, also five hundred thousand dollars, you think it's a lot, but more, these these kids are so small; they're very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time you start uh, raising children up, uh, you know, by the time they hit eighteen, that's yeah. a lot of years from now. So yep. that money is going to be gone very uh, yeah. very quickly. And plus, it could be medical bills and mm -hmm. all that. Could be psychological trauma and things oh. that might have to be treated here too, yeah. as well. You wow. know, these kids. Man, your your mom and dad aren't here anymore. It's like Just what? Wake up an orphan one Saturday it's morning. It's a wound yeah. that God is going to have to help them to heal from. And you know, God is he's he's done that before. It so, seems yeah. like I'm glad you mentioned that because it seems like when it's something natural, uh, one of your parents is taken because it's their time mm -hmm. to go, then it's uh, something that gets healed easy, much more easily, mm -hmm. readily yeah. uh, by God's design instead of having it be some, you know, uh, personal moral failings where somebody leaves or whatever. Right, right, that seems yeah. to be a wound that gets deeper and harder mm -hmm. to heal because someone made a choice to right. leave instead of just they were being taken away. Yeah. Um, but Ryan and Jen were very active in the, several parishes in the Metro Detroit. Some of our staff members have, have recognized their faces from mm -hmm. seeing different churches. Um, we'd like to say, uh, before we move on, a, a prayer for them, if we yeah. could, eternal rest. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And eternal rest. Eternal rest granted grant them, O Lord. Lord. And, and may your perpetual light shine, shine upon them. them. May, may their, their souls, and souls of all the faithful departed the through the mercy of God, God rest in peace. peace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, David, you have some specifics, I think, about I mean we're having someone who is fleeing uh, the police his lights are off because he's fleeing uh, they don't see the car or the tr stolen truck I believe it mm -hmm. was coming at them because he has his lights off because he's fleeing the police and because he's driving reckless and trying to get away he crosses the meridian to come into that lane and hits them mm -hmm. and that's kind of the essence of the story yeah. yeah so the notes from the police where they saw the stolen truck at a gas station uh, it was at 1 30 a.m so mm. you know wee hours of the morning um the driver of the truck maneuvered to get out of the, out of the gas station lot, nearly hit the patrol car. Mm. Um, and he fled from police. They made repeated efforts to pull him over. Uh, he got on the freeway, and then he got off the freeway. And here, here and at least in this part of Michigan, there's always like an access road, and the ramp goes onto the access road. So he takes the ramp, he does a U-turn, turns off his headlights while he's doing that, and then goes back onto the freeway. So he's driving, he got off just to turn around, and now now he's driving the wrong way mm. and you know this is like 1 32 in the morning headlights turned off and then that's when the collision happened and the yeah. parents were out on a date night so they weren't obviously planning for this type of thing they I mean, probably no one ever planned yeah. no but yeah. I mean you know they'd been you know, six kids it's yeah. tough taking care of you know six kids and then they get a little time off and then this happens it's, it's tragic all around it's, yeah. it's kind of incomprehensible you have a few details too Rodney to bring uh no I just actually just one of the things I want to say about it is I don't know what the um, I don't know where the kids have gone if they've gone into foster care they're, or they're, they're with loved ones they're with uh, family. family or friends but they're Good. they ask that people respect their privacy so the I, exact details obviously are, yeah. obviously yeah. but one of the things that you know God forbid anything happens what parents uh, should consider doing is establishing a will and putting in the will you have to think what's the worst that can happen and talk to family members talk to people where can your kids go if some if the worst happens to you you and know that's, that's an amazing thing you bring it up a living will basically we're talking yeah. about here and putting in details like that when most parents wouldn't even possibly conceive of not being I mean maybe when the kids are 18 or 20 mm -hmm. or 30 or 40 in Europe and you're 50 60 70s but when you just have a bunch of kids like that, it's really amazing that if you had the foresight mm -hmm. to to come up with a plan like that. Yeah. Uh, but it is good advice. Uh, I know the Franciscans oftentimes were pushing to have a living will, so it would just take care of all of the, uh, you know, fighting over the things at the end and all that. But this is another whole reason why to think about that. What is your contingency? And I'd like to put out there that as the world is very complicated today. There are many threats to people's livelihood and health. 
If you are living in many areas of the world, those are mothers and fathers and they have children and those are families as well. If you are in the Ukraine, if you are in uh, anywhere in the Middle East, I mean, pick a country in the Middle East. If you are in many areas of Africa where all of this violence is going on, if you are in many areas in Asia, uh, where uh, parts of, of China and other places where you might be abducted or whatnot. So this is a very violent world these days. It's a very unsafe, unsure world. We are secure mm -hmm. in the fact that we are in God's presence and his graces and hopefully so, if not, get to confession, mm -hmm. um, get yourself in his, in his love and embrace. And that should allay all of our concerns as far as, you know, staying up at night worrying about things. That's not what we're talking about here. But he also gave us prudence. Right. And so what you're talking about here is really not in the context of just maybe a one-off where a drunken driver mm -hmm. can be, uh, you know, at fault. But we're talking about now where China and Russia and uh, Iran and North Korea are all talking about nuclear weapons. Mm. And you're talking about chaos that could be, uh, you know, like fifth column type stuff in this country and everything. So lots of things could go wrong mm -hmm. in this world, not just a one off drunken driver. Now we're in a very uh, sophisticated world where uh, evil has its sway, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, because of the times we're in, because we're aborting so many babies, yeah. because yeah. of all of the uh, immorality in the church and in the world. So anyway, I would uh, I would second that, that talk about if you do have children, do you have family, what is the backup plan if one day you're not there? Mm -hmm. um, and another whole instance where uh, what, like pro-lifers being arrested, yeah. you know, or someone knocking on your door, uh, who, who was the uh, family just read, Huck? Uh, uh, yeah, Mark Houck. Mark yeah, Houck. Yeah, yeah. And one day he's gone, mm -hmm. you know, and then what happens where the mother, you know, what are we going to do with the kids if I have to go to court and bail them out or something? Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. lots of reasons why you might yeah. want to have a thought mm -hmm. about what's going to happen with the kids just for a minute. If both of you are, for whatever reason, temporarily or longer out of the picture, mm -hmm. we're in the age of COVID-19 and no COVID-20 and COVID-21. Mm -hmm. And and are you going to be in the hospital and tell you where the kid's going to be? Yeah. So just give it some thought yeah. like that. If it doesn't come all the way to a will, at least give it some thought and talk to some people. And there is kind of the, the I guess you call it the scandal of evil because, you know, you have six children who are orphaned now. You have two parents that were, by all accounts, good Catholics. They went to Mass, all of this. Why did God allow this terrible, terrible thing to happen? That's, that's, that's always a big yeah. uh, Big question yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah. and um, another thing that stories like this uh, make me think about is how we as Catholics, um, what a beautiful thing it is that we have the ability to pray for the dead, for the yeah. souls in purgatory. Um, I One of my favorite uh, mass settings in the year is the, the funeral mass, the requiem mass. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I study chant and that's, um, there's a, a beauty and a simplicity um, to that and all so many of the prayers are in addition to praying for the dead also contemplating our own mortality how we too will die someday uh, and it's th there's something profoundly catholic about that that mm -hmm. i think a lot of uh, many segments of the protestant world are sort of missing out on because they don't believe in purgatory and so uh, in their thinking so sort of death is just oh they're dead it's over nothing mm -hmm. you can do yeah, the, the whole thing, too, with this, uh, why, why God allows evil, very complicated uh, aspect. But we always have to know that God does have a higher plan. He can bring good out mm -hmm. of it. Uh, I, I would like to bring up, just in closing here, uh, Margaret Clitheroe, I believe, as, if I'm mm -hmm. saying her name, say That's Margaret right. Clitheroe. Yeah. And she had four children during the Protestant uh, re revolt. And she was actually uh, put to death by Protestants. Mm -hmm. And they, one of the things they said was, you know, we're going to kill you if you don't recant or become Protestant or whatever. If, uh, and you have four children and they're all going to become Protestant. Yeah. We're going to see to it that they become Protestant. Well, she entrusted her, you know, future to God and their future and she stayed strong in the faith. And of course, that witness of their mother mm -hmm. dying, uh, you know, at the hands of these people, uh, riveted their children in saying, well, that is not the one true church. I know this must be mom died for it and, and mm -hmm. horrifically so. And 
one went on to be a priest, one on religious, you know, and all this. But great, four great Catholic children. Mm -hmm. Of course, they have her praying for them. And, and I would like to say if the children are listening or had a, somebody else that was and wanted to speak to them, um, your parents are going to be, first of all, needing your prayers if they're in purgatory for a period of time because they're not, no one's perfect in this lifetime. So please pray for them. But also know that they are continually their job for <laughs> all eternity is praying for mm -hmm. the children. Yeah. So you'll be closer to them now in the communion of saints. And that's a wonderful thing if someone's listening and wants to talk about that. The communion of saints mm -hmm. where you can say, well, you, your, your mom and dad died as good Catholics. Mm -hmm. And if they're in purgatory a very short period of time and they are beholding you, caring for you, mm -hmm. loving you, St. Teresa of Lisieux said, I want to spend my eternity doing good on earth. And I'm yeah. sure the parents are focused yep. on the children. Yep. Yeah. And a final story for today. There's data showing a strong link between mar marijuana use among teenagers and forms of psychosis. An article published this week in the Wall Street Journal discusses a growing problem of weed contributing to schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Now, why is this a growing trend among teens? Because marijuana, it's because marijuana is becoming legal for adults in more and more states. And the illicit market for weed, the black market is also growing. And the type of marijuana on the market is becoming more and more potent. All of this is leading to a growth in underage kids damaging their brains with marijuana use. And not only that, but the uh, m uh, moral damage that's yeah. going on, because uh, why is it appropriate to have marijuana outlawed where, you know, with the prohibition where we didn't have alcohol outlawed? Mm -hmm. And what many people who are closer to this in the science uh, are saying is that marijuana, there is no sipping a little bit of alcohol and sipping a little bit of alcohol and you feel a little warmer and that mm -hmm. you're still in control of your senses whereas you're puffing on weed and you may be mm. impaired mm -hmm. and you're actually that's the the main problem with alcohol drinking it to excess after say one beer because it tastes so good or refresh you or cool mm -hmm. you still have your senses about yeah. you um, and you're able to enjoy a beer or a drink uh, at a social event and wait for a while and have another one where you're not giving up your sense of reason. And when you throw away that sense of reason, that's where the morality is mm -hmm. because now you're at the level of a beast and you're doing whatever right. and all the things that happen because of that after that, you're open to. Mm -hmm. And that's where the immorality comes in, whereas the, the, the dope smoking is you're giving that up uh, in, in a sudden way. Yeah, because... Uh marijuana is just simply a plant there are so many variations um in wine we would call it the terroir or whatever the french word is you know the soil conditions mm. as well as the genetics of the plant that the the thc level the level of you know what gets you high can vary so much there's no way of really knowing mm -hmm. whereas with alcohol you can know okay this is whiskey have just a little bit three percent yeah by volume or whatever yeah mm -hmm. this is this is wine have a glass or two and then you know you know how wine affects you it's a stronger wine it's a weak wine. a lot of that is known whereas there's so much variation with marijuana and also um to draw that analogy to alcohol, there is, uh, as you were saying, Brad, um, the, the point of mortal sin is forfeiting the use of reason, is how I've had it explained to me. And um, you get into venial sin when you go past the point of hilarity. But the nature of how people take in marijuana mm -hmm. is that's not always clear. So you don't really know mm. until you know, 10, 20 minutes later when you've passed that point of hilarity and have approached the you've forfeited the use of reason mm. and the w the type of high also is it's very unusual for you to just feel slightly giggly and that's it that's like very unusual especially with the types of marijuana today that are so potent with thc mm -hmm. yeah the the scandal too of the youth growing up in homes i know in pure michigan today everywhere mm -hmm. there's signs you for marijuana smell it everywhere oh, too. Yeah. Ridiculous. You walk in the grocery store, somebody crosses your path and this cloud of of marijuana stinks yeah, all the time them. in grocery stores. Yeah, grocery <laughs> stores, even driving yeah. down the road, a car will pass you and it's like you get you get hit with this cloud in your own See, car. I never know whether it's marijuana or a skunk cuz we also have skunks around. Oh, well, yeah. They, 
<laughs> well, now similar just, smell, you know. <laughs> kind of a kind of a you know connecting the stories here. Was the gentleman who was driving the getaway was he mm -hmm. under impaired? Was he impaired some way or shape form? Yeah. And what we've just got done talking about there, you don't know when you're losing the mm -hmm. uh, ability to reason. And now so many people smoking marijuana. Are yeah. they getting in vehicles and driving? And next thing you know, the roads are not as safe as right. they used to be prior to the laws coming right. in. Uh, then you also have the whole gateway drug mm -hmm, uh, mentality mm -hmm. where I started smoking weed and next thing you know I'm doing some whatever speed or whatever else of uh, meth mm -hmm. and I guess it's the meth now. Yeah. Um, but the all of these different drugs that start to come in, you know, it all generally started with smoking some marijuana and then on up the scale. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's where, I, I mean, a lot of people will say, well, if you actually looked at it, it would be alcohol, but the alcohol, if it just stated alcohol, isn't the dot in the line. It's mm -hmm. the alcohol went to marijuana, and then at that point in time, mm -hmm. that's when it starts going into yeah. the other drugs. So you're having a gateway drug going on, which bring a lot of people, and if all of these people are starting, you, if you're a kid and you grow up, and yeah, my dad and mom smoked dope in the house, well, of course, you're gonna be smoking dope mm -hmm. in the house. You're probably addicted just by secondhand smoke, mm -hmm. nothing else. Yeah, I think a lot about, um, there was a time where I, living in an apartment building, um, there's, there were people, neighbors of mine who were, you know, raising kids, have a few kids raising a family in an apartment building. And for months, there was a resident elsewhere in the building every day, just the smell of marijuana, just constantly, mm. <laughs> like all day and all night, it seemed just emanating out of this one apartment in the building. And it just gets everywhere. The smell gets everywhere. And I just, you know, feel bad for these poor kids who grow up because, you know, their neighbor next door or across the hallway or whatever is smoking so much marijuana all the time. So this kid is having issues where, you know, his clothes and his backpack and his lunchbox all are starting to smell like that because it just gets everywhere. And you know, going back to the the beginning of this this whole thing is the 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 uh, the Wall Street Journal actually you know released an article talking about this. So this is becoming mainstream about how people are becoming uh, I guess you could say injured uh, in various ways by smoking increasingly more powerful uh, forms of marijuana. Because we're saying they're actually becoming psychotic. Right, right, right. So back in the you know the old days, well, you see movies where you know. Cheech and Chong, they were burnouts, you know, they were potheads, they were just kind of dopey and dumb and all that, and they played that up, but I don't know, I went to college and I I knew a couple people who were really like that, and they smoked all the time, so, but that was, you know, with kind of the low-grade old-fashioned stuff. Um, you know, the, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse actually had a report, uh, and it says research has shown the cannabis use is associated with an increase increased risk for an earlier onset of psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia wow. in people with other risk factors such as family history. Cannabis intoxication can also induce a temporary psychotic episode in some individuals, especially at high doses, which is what everybody's getting nowadays. Experiencing such an episode may be linked with the risk for later development, uh, developing a psychotic disorder. And, uh, you know, people People who kind of lived through the 60s, there were people like that. They were like, oh, LSD, just take it. It's fun, blah, blah. And there were people who took LSD and then they were different. Like they, they went into full blown schizophrenia. Uh, Sid Barrett, the original guy from Pink Floyd, yeah, was, was one. Came to mind for yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really heavy into LSD. Now he probably had a family history of schizophrenia. There's probably other conditions. Doesn't mean, you know, you do these drugs, you'll get it. But but uh, as this report noted, um, it kind of it can accelerate. They're not necessarily sure, but they do know that it helps these mental disorders to come on uh, faster. Now I'd like to throw a little curve in there, bringing yeah. the spiritual for a second. When you talk to an exorcist and you say, well, there was a, a habitual use of drugs mm -hmm. uh, in, in the mix. Uh, and he will say, well, that opened doors. Mm -hmm. What was yep. it, the, the band Doors was talking the doors, about? Yeah. Opening the doors, doors of perception. Right, yeah. Yeah. okay. But these exorcists are saying, yeah, doors are being opened, mm -hmm. but any uh, mortal sin, habitual mortal sin, whether it's you know fornication or same-sex relationships, um, just 
going to satanic masses, of course, but mm -hmm. any of these uh, types of immersing yourself in sin, especially when we're talking about giving up the use of reason, right. because your reason and your conscience is supposed to be kind of a, you know, helping to keep the doors, you know, and say, well, this demonic thing's trying to take me over. I don't want that, or I can feel. And so you're lowering your ability to be mm -hmm. defend yourself yep. at the same time you're giving your control over to any spirits that want to move you so especially when you say schizophrenia multiple personality disorders mm -hmm. you start running that past a uh, an exorcist and he will say well that's actually one of the signs not that mm -hmm. there isn't a clinical thing right. that can actually yeah. work out there but it's one of the signs mm -hmm. also that can be explained in some instances by demonic influence and the personalities you're getting there are Belizebub and Lucifer and mm -hmm. you know God knows who else that's exhibiting in that person. Yeah, there was a, an episode of the podcast, The uh, Exorcist Files, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering the name of it, yeah. Um, and what that was about, that was about a, a girl who was, yeah, experienced trauma and had, I can't remember if it was schizophrenia or some other, uh, psych, you know, psychological disorder. And in addition to that, there was also a demonic thing happening because demons don't play fair. They take nope. advantage of nope. vulnerable people, you know, um, was, was basically her story. Um, yeah, and some actually do point... Um, do say that the majority of people who come to them are either people faking it or people need, who just need medication. Mm. But there are also, um, I know of uh, one exorcist who also had a background in psychology and that was very helpful for his job because mm -hmm. he, could, he could tell, um, you know, does this person just need medication because they've got some serious thing with the, the wiring in their brain or mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, whatever the, the medical term is, or is there actually a, something supernatural happening? Yeah, and if you listen to a lot of accounts of people who use you know, the Timothy Leary, uh, you know, with LSD stuff, with ayahuasca is another thing. It's this rainforest vine that they mm -hmm. do. They go on spirit quests and uh, also using uh, mescaline, the American Indians out west. Uh, I think that's from a cactus or peyote something like or that, peyote, that mm -hmm. type of stuff. There's almost always, there's, for these guys, there's a spiritual dimension for it. That's why they say, you know, their third eye is open. The doors of perception are thrown open. They understand everything differently now. And they don't, it's not like they started going to, Latin mass after that and really getting into the faith. <laughs> they start throwing out, well, God doesn't exist. The universe has energy and it loves us and all this crazy stuff. That's the stuff. message you're getting from That's the, the message they're getting. But also, there are times where people will say, a being spoke to me. And at you know various times, the beings will say, worship me. Like Car Carlos Santana was you know, a fantastic guitar player, but he was known for using psychedelic drugs too and he some god some being called metatron you oh, know yeah, contacted that, him right. and said i'm the one so like when he, he has it like written in the mansion on his floor and you know like so there really is congress between people and preternatural entities that happen with this and some people are okay with that so when you talk about drugs opening the door to to the satanic that's definitely what's happening in, in a lot of instances where yeah. that's, that's it starts yeah. to have the influence before we close out though uh we have to say, why is there such a rise in drug abuse? Mm. We're looking at anesthetizing yeah. ourselves. Why? Because we're not high on life. Mm -hmm. We don't have all of that which God wanted to give us, a happy family, loving parents, mm. uh, you know, siblings within a family. So it's not just a one-off person there. Uh, jobs available mm -hmm. that you can work, you know, going to school where you really get uh, educated in how to think and what the world is really about, not indoctrinated into saying, well, you know, you must be a racist because you're a white boy or something mm -hmm. like that, or you're bad because you're male or whatever. Uh, you're the wrong sex, or if you think you're the wrong sex at the age of three, let's go ahead and give a sex mm -hmm. change, you, you know, all that yeah. pressure. Um, and all of those pieces are really scrambled today. We don't really have a strong vocal church, you know, at, at all levels from the pews, mm -hmm. you know, the, from the pulpit all the way up through to the Vatican, um, really in lockstep. I mean, 
my goodness, look at all the bishops today just out on this one thing about same-sex blessings. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. want something, they're out on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guys saying no to this and others saying, well, it hadn't go far enough, you know, and all mm -hmm. in between. So um, it really has to have a unity there for all these young kids to be able to have a world that they feel like they're being nurtured, brought along, feeling safe. And when they're not, and it's all jaded and all that, and you got the demonic always beating on you, plus fallen human nature, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you start turning more and more to drugs. It seems like it's evidence that the world is not nurturing the way it should these yeah. young people. Uh, and I really think that has to be uh, remedied before you know we get, uh, you know, the, the things are just gonna keep going out of whack and we need mm -hmm. to be able to turn the tide back. And it's gotta start with getting kids high on life again, which has to start with the authentic plan of God. Yeah. You know, They have yeah. a conscience, they have minds that are ready to be formed and all that. So, well, thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of The Download. Now please join us as we finish in prayer, begging Our Lady's intercession for our nation and our church. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Ducedo, Spes Nostra Salve. Ad te clamamus exules fili hebe, ad te suspiramus gementes efflentes, in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo advocata nostra, ilos tuos misericordes oculos ad nos converte. Et Iesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis vos hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O via, O dulcis, Virgo Maria. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for the download, and a special thanks to our supporters who make videos like this possible. From all of us here at Church Militant, God bless you.